Perfect. Okay, perfect. So um, hi, everyone. I'm Tasneem. I'm one of the um, PGY2 um, neurology residents, and this is my case presentation titled An Unexpected Connection. So um, this is a man that I saw in the neuro ICU. He's 52 years old. Um, he's left-handed, and he presents with three days of lethargy and decreased PO intake. His HPI, so he presented with, again, three days of progressive lethargy, decreased PO intake, and then on the third day, he became aphasic and was no longer following commands, and that's what prompted his family to seek treatment. They went to an outside hospital. There, the CT head revealed a right frontal mass, so they started him on Decadron and Kepra and then transferred him to Duke. Let's see. Um, his physical exam, so by the time that I saw him, he was actually getting better. Um, his mental status, he was alert and oriented only to self and place, not to time. Um, he was able to speak when I saw him and understand, but he was unable to calculate. He incorrectly identified right versus left in both upper and lower extremities. He couldn't name his different fingers and he was unable to write. Um, his cranial nerves were unremarkable, um, and the remainder of his general neuro exam was unremarkable. I um, mean, I do want to mention that when I, and I'll discuss this a little later, later on, but when I gave him a paper telescope and asked him to look at me, um, he looked through his left eye, and I'll kind of talk about the importance of that a little later. Um, initial labs were um, largely unremarkable, other than a, a leukocytosis to 12 also keeping in mind that he did get a dose of Decadron at the outside hospital. Um, so this was the CT head from the outside hospital. This was the MRI that we got here. And so um, the first one is a um, axial flare. And the second one is a, a sagittal T2. Um, and this is the axial T1 contrast study. And so, you know, we did um, a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis with the biggest concern being malignancy somewhere else when we had heard from the outside hospital that this is a man coming in with a new right mass looking for, again, malignancy. But the only thing that the CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis showed was this pulmonary arteriovenous malformation. So his hospital course, so he went through the OR for a biopsy and there they found um, that there was a lot of what looked like purulent material. So he also underwent a washout. His path showed um, inflammation and necrotic debris that was consistent with the cerebral abscess. So he was started on Vank, Cefepime, and Metronidazole, and his cultures grew st uh, strep intermediates, which is one of the Viridans um, strep. The next day, ID was consulted, and we had switched um, to Metronidazole um, and started Ceftriaxone. His TTE was negative for vegetations, and then on the 22nd, he did undergo um, a pulmonary AVM embolization um, with the concern that it might have been contributing to his, uh, like, a cause of his abscess. Um, and then on the 23rd, he was discharged on ceftriaxone and metronidazole for six to eight weeks. I do want to mention here that IR, they did the embolization, but unfortunately, they said that it was a really difficult case, and they weren't sure if they got it completely. They repeated um, like the flow studies, and they did find abnormal flow through the venous part of the AVM. And they said, you know, do a bubble study, and if it's positive, it means it's still there, and we have to re-embolize. And they did a bubble study, like an echo with bubble study, and it was positive, so they're actually going to re-embolize it in the outpatient setting. Um, so just to talk a little bit about brain abscesses and pulmonary AVMs. So a pulmonary AVM, it produces a continuous right to left shunt. And because of that shunt, there's impaired pulmonary filtration that can lead to these paradoxical um, thromboemboli or septic microemboli. 5% of patients with a pulmonary AVM de develop a brain abscess. And most of the time, these are in people who have multiple AVMs, like in patients with hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias. These are patients who have AVMs throughout multiple organ systems. Um, but there are case reports of people who have a brain abscess with isolated pulmonary AVMs. And I just wanted to highlight a few of them here. But I think the biggest takeaway is that um, 
pulmonary AVMs can be completely asymptomatic, no hemoptysis, no shortness of breath. And the only way that people find them is from a brain abscess. So these are five cases of exactly that. Asymptomatic PV PAVMs come in with a brain abscess, pan scan them, they find an AVM, which is why I want to say that, you know, in someone who has a brain abscess and there's no clear etiology, I do think it's a good idea to um, pan scan them looking for a potential AVM if there's no other clear cause of the brain abscess. And then lastly, I want to talk about Gerstmann syndrome, which is what we think that he had. So it's a combination of finger agnosia or the inability to name, identify, or discriminate the fingers, um, left, right hand disorientation, um, agraphia, which is inability to write, and the and acalculia, the inability to um, to spell. It's located in this area, um, Broadman's area 39. Usually it's the frontal, uh, it's the dominant parietal lobe. And so for him, his mass was in the right um, frontal parietal area, right? Some of the edema extended to the parietal area. But I was really, you know, um, impressed that, right? So although he was left handed, so let me take a step back. Most people are right-handed. Most people are left brain dominant. And then even 90% of people who are left-handed are still left brain dominant. So here was a man who you know, was left-handed, clearly coming in with a right frontal parietal um, lesion, clearly has what looks like a dominant parietal lobe syndrome, also had the aphasia, but I still needed more evidence that he was right dominant. So I wanted to share something that Dr. Chang taught me, and I think she's here, and I'm so glad she's here. But Dr. Chang in the neuro ICU taught me a trick um, where you stand in the middle and you give a patient, uh, you kind of fold a paper like this, like a telescope, and you stand right in the middle so that you're not biasing them and you tell them to look at you. And whichever eye they hold it up to, their opposite side brain dominant. So I gave it to him, he held it, um, and he put it up to his left eye. Um, and that for me was like, okay, I have multiple signs here that this man really is right brain dominant. So I thought that was interesting. I wanted to share it. And thank you again, Dr. Chang. Um, so these are my references and I just wanna say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tasmin. excellent. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna begin with the case presentation actually. Um, I thought that was my responsibility, but it ties into the, the talk pretty well. So um, this was a patient that uh, we treated as a group, the uh, epilepsy neurologist and I. She's a 31-year-old woman who is right-handed. She presented with a history of drug-resistant epilepsy. Didn't have any other significant past medical history. And her seizures went back to age eight. So had a 20-year history of drug-resistant seizures. At the time we saw her, she was being managed medically with Lamictal and Keppra and had taken a couple other anti-epileptic drugs prior to that. So importantly, her seizure semiology, when her seizures occurred, uh, typically happened during her sleep when she would wake up, be unresponsive, exhibit lip smacking, sometimes move her arms. Those events were occurring approximately every week or two, and very rarely would they generalize into a secondary tonic-clonic type seizures. She also experienced a second uh, rare seizure type that occurred during the daytime, which uh, per report involved a vague feeling of dizziness, fogginess, and panic. So she underwent workup here at Duke, which involved a video EEG study. What that noted is that both of these clinical seizure types were occurring from somewhere in the right temporal occipital region. So not super well localized, but were lateralized over to the right, perhaps more posterior side of the right cerebral hemisphere. She did not have any kind of MRI abnormality and also underwent neuropsychometric testing, which didn't really show a very particularly remarkable finding. She had some mild deficits in attention, an executive functioning, which could have perhaps been related to her AED use, um, but did not exhibit any deficits in her verbal or visual spatial functioning. So to try to better understand where her seizures were coming from, we undertook a stereo EEG study. And so based on the, the video EEG results, the scalp EEG results, we implant an area in the right temporal region, as well as the junction of the temporal lobe with the occipital and parietal lobes. We placed 14 stereo EEG wires using robotic assistance. So you can see here, some of the wires here uh, did also go into the uh, hippocampus and amygdala temporal pole, the more posterior areas of the temporal lobe, uh, surveying neocortical areas there, then back into the occipital area here and parietal area as well. <clears throat> 
So during the, the Stereo EG recording, she had six clinical seizures, a number of subclinical events, and then one provoked a seizure. And so a deep site in the superior posterior parietal lobe was involved in all of her seizures. And then additionally, very quickly, we saw activity in the superficial portion of the inferior occipital lobe as well. So if I were to kind of draw that out here, it was an electrode up here and then some electrodes down here. So this was more of the deeper parts of this trajectory and down here in the more superficial parts of this trajectory here. So when she underwent stimulation testing through these implanted wires, stimulation of the parietal site, again, the area that was there in the spontaneous seizures to be highly involved, stimulation of that site did elicit a sensation of dizziness and double vision, which is typical of her early seizure semiology. And then stimulation of those more inferior occipital sites also elicited at least electrographic seizures that were typical of what we observed during the stereo EG. Additionally, stimulation is important as we think about the treatments. Stimulation of the seizure onset areas, again noted through the stereo EG, also elicited visual findings. So she'd have visual disturbances with stimulation of some of those sites, suggesting that her seizure onset areas were either in or very close to areas that were involved in her vision. And so based on this, we consider different surgical treatments. And so it would have been possible to perhaps apply more generic type treatments, such as a VNS or a deep brain stimulator to treat her epilepsy. We did have some sense that while this was a somewhat diffuse area, that there were kind of key focal areas that were highly involved in her seizures. They were not ones that could be resected, again, because those areas were thought to have important uh, function with respect to her vision. So what we did decide to do was to implant a, what's called the responsive neurostimulator device. So you can see one of these devices here in the top left. This is showing uh, one of a couple different configurations that we can use with this device. What it consists of is a computer or battery shown here. And then at least connected to the device are two leads. And leads can be different configurations as I mentioned. They can either be uh, depth electrodes like this that are implanted directly into the brain parenchyma. Uh, and or in addition, uh, or I should say instead, or in addition, they can involve these strips that are placed onto the brain surface. And so we'll sometimes implant more of these than we actually connect. So we have the option in the future to come with a more minimal surgery and connect other alternative wires uh, to the computer. But in her case, what we did is we targeted depth electrodes to this deeper site here. So there are different contact spacings that can be used on this depth electrode and planted one into this parietal area. Again, where more deeply we saw onset of seizures and then more superficially down here in these two uh, occipital sites here. And so this one here was actually connected to the computer as was this one here. And then there's a third one placed here, which you see is not connected to the computer. And the way this device works is when patients detect seizure events, or someone around them detects a seizure event, uh, they can place a magnet over the device which causes it to log activity. So it's actually recording brain activity and it saves a window of brain activity, it goes back 90 seconds from the time a magnet is, um, is placed over the device and records those. Those can then be downloaded and transferred over for review uh, by neurosurgeons and, and neurologists. And so over time, we train this device as to what uh, seizure activity looks like. And with time, we actually train it to detect early phases of seizure activity. And when it does so, it can then be um, programmed to deliver different patterns of stimulation that theoretically disrupt early seizure activity and prevent seizures from uh, manifesting clinically. So this is an example. Uh, we have uh, four channels of recording through the device. And so for example, you can record between these two electrodes, that would be this trace here, these two electrodes here and so on. Uh, and so in different areas, uh, we can pick up the seizure-like activity, use stimulation to try to disrupt the seizures. And so this is the implant right here. You see the computer is actually um, implanted into a skull window that we drill out. So remove a portion of the skull and lay this uh, device into that skull defect. And then through small burr holes here, implant these depth and uh, strip electrodes into or on the surface of the brain. And so we have nine month outcome uh, results in this patient. So her seizure frequency has been reduced by around 75 to 80%. The seizures that she does continue to have are of shorter duration than they were prior to uh, RNS implantation. She actually for the last two and a half months or so has been entirely seizure free. 
She is not, uh, because we're able to titrate and to alter the stimulation parameter, she has not actually experienced stimulation, stimulation induced uh, side effects, such as visual disturbances from the RNS. And she continues on her baseline AD regimen. With more time, perhaps we may consider uh, reducing her medications down somewhat. So while this has been an effective therapy for this patient, um, it and our other surgical treatments uh, still uh, have marked limitations. One is the invasiveness of current surgical techniques, such as this one. Another, particularly with treatments such as resection or laser ablation, are expected neurocognitive impacts that can be caused by removing or destroying brain tissue. Additionally, both the RNS and some of our other treatments uh, often fail to completely control seizures, they, in the case of the RNS or other neurostimulation devices, involve the implantation of foreign non-biologic devices. As is the case for the RNS as well and other types of neurostimulators, these batteries or the computer in this case don't last forever. So we have to do additional surgeries. In the case of RNS, make a large scalp incision. Um, and that could be repeated over several times of the patient's life. So we take a 30-year-old patient, the battery that lasts right now around seven to eight years, She's looking at potentially another six, seven surgeries and involve a large scalp opening at risk for infection, things that could then necessitate removal of the device, for example. So there's a high requirement for reoperation with many of our surgical treatments. So this all together leads us to a need for expanded surgical treatments that can offer improved or additional seizure control, potentially with lower invasiveness and morbidity. And so today I'm gonna to talk about prospective surgical therapy uh, that may uh, counteract or add to our current treatments, and that's interneuron transplantation. So to basically outline the talk, I'll talk about the function and development of these cells uh, in native uh, situations, uh, describe basic laboratory observations that study interneuron transplantation, get into some of the preclinical studies that have looked at this as a therapy for epilepsy in rodent models, describe then its potential clinical applications some of the knowledge gaps and challenges uh, that, that stand in the way of clinical implantation, and then discuss an ongoing phase one clinical trial. So as Rich mentioned, cortical interneurons are inhibitory uh, neural circuit elements. They're very connective cells that tend to make dense and local projections. There's some more recent evidence that cortical interneurons can project long distances across the brain, um, both within the cortex and to subcortical areas but primarily these cells make projections locally in the neocortex and other cortical areas. They secrete the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, as well as some other neuropeptides such as NPY and or somatostatin. And as shown here in the schematic here, there are very different classes of interneurons that can be characterized in a number of different dimensions. One of those would be the expression of different cellular markers, such as parvalbumin or relin, VIP, somatostatin, Additionally, the cells can be classified based on their intrinsic spiking properties. So some of these spell cells in response to current injections will fire very rapidly, others less rapidly, some in stuttering fashion, some in accommodating fashion. So that's one other way in which the cells are, are classified. Additionally, their morphologies differentiate uh, different types of interneurons. And so there's some types of interneurons that synapse onto the cell body of their postsynaptic targets, such as this cell here. Uh, this being a pyramidal cell here in gray. There are other types of interneurons that synapse, say, onto the uh, proximal segments of dendrites. <clears throat> and so interneurons mediate various forms of synaptic inhibition, feed forward, feed back, lateral inhibition. And as Rich mentioned, they also contribute uh, highly to network oscillations. And these are uh, phenomena that are disturbed pathologically in, in epilepsy. What's interesting about these cells is that they're actually generated remotely from the cerebral cortex during development. And so this is a schematic here that depicts the developing brain, whether it's a rodent brain or human brain, looks like this approximately halfway to two thirds of the way through gestation. And so this is one hemisphere here, again, in coronal plane, the area above where I'm moving the mouse here develops into the cerebral cortex. The area below the mouse down here that becomes subcortical areas. And so excitatory neurons, the pyramidal cells of the neocortex are produced in the area that becomes the neocortex. So in other words, they're made locally. There are progenitor cells here 
that uh, sit uh, just uh, in from the what becomes the lateral ventricle, in this case, the uh, telencephalic vesicle here, those cells migrate radially into their final laminar position, the final layer position in the cortex. Now, by contrast, interneurons, the inhibitory interneurons, are produced ventrally down in areas that become the globus pallidus, and to a lesser degree, the striatum. Those areas are called the MGE and CG, the medial and caudal ganglionic eminences. And from those origins, unlike the excitatory cells, which are produced locally, from their origins, developing interneurons undergo this long distance tangential migration by which they populate the developing cerebral cortex. They're basically intermixing with locally produced excitatory cells. They migrate, they integrate into nascent neural circuits. And perhaps that's because Perhaps that's because I should say that because these cells develop in that way, they perhaps have this capacity when transplanted to the postnatal brain, they're able to disperse through the recipient tissue and integrate into neural circuits of the host. And so I was involved in research that, that um, by which we transplanted cells. We took these cells from the developing MG of the rodent brain, performed a cell suspension, transplanted those cells into the parenchyma of the recipient. What we found, we used cells that came from donors that expressed GFP, a fluorescent protein that allows us to track these cells in the recipient. We found that these cells dispersed significant distances and started to develop morphologies that were characteristic of interneurons in the recipient. And so this is the neocortex here, the P up here, deeper layers down here. Um, this is zoomed out here, looking at a coronal section with posterior areas of the brain. So all neocortex here, this is actually the amygdala here, and the hippocampus, we see that these transplanted cells, when at least put in the neonatal brain, have dispersed significant distances and started to uh, populate the recipient cortex. And so what our work and the work of other labs has shown is that these transplanted cells begin to express markers that are characteristic of mature interneurons. So they express the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, as shown here. Additionally, we look at counts of GABAergic cells in the recipient brain and ask whether transplantation of these cells reduces the number of native cells or adds to it, we find that transplantation merely adds additional cells. So these cells are not replacing exogenous cells. They're actually acting to add to the population of interneurons in the cortex. And again, we found that by comparing counts of hemispheres that did not receive transplanted cells, looking at the native GABAergic interneuron numbers to the number of native cells after we transplant large numbers. And so at least in the early brain, there's a capacity to support somewhere around 30 to 40% of additional cortical interneurons after transplantation. So in addition to expressing GABA, uh, transplanted cells in uh, a manner that is dependent on where they're taken from. So if you take MG type cells versus CG type cells, in native development, those two areas make somewhat non-overlapping classes of interneurons. If you take cells from MG and transplant them versus cells from CG and transplant them, you find that there are somewhat different um, marker expressions in the two populations. You get greater fractions of parvalbumin, somatostatin expressing cells with MG transplants, whereas with the CG type transplants, there's larger proportions of VIP and uh, real and expressing type cells. That's important because there's some thought that MG type cells tend to make synapses more preferentially onto excitatory type cells whereas CG type cells tend to make synapses, not more preferentially, but to a large degree at least, onto inhibitory type cells. And so if we think about different therapies, potentially use of CG type cells in a case of, such as epilepsy, where hyperexcitability is an issue, potentially placing CG type cells, which inhibit other native interneurons that could potentially promote seizures by a disinhibitory effect. Um, but getting back to how these cells develop in the recipient brain, so when we look at the physiology of these cells as well, they also take on physiologic identities that are characteristic of their donor uh, areas. And so MG type cells, I'm showing here more fast spiking type uh, physiology characteristic of these PV classes. Over here, this uh, other uh, spiking properties more characteristic of CG type cells. Uh, a number of these were, were noted with CG transplants, but just showing the um, one of those here this continuous irregular spiking of phenotype. So additionally, what we found is that beyond just taking on the identities of interneurons in the recipient, these cells actually functionally integrate in synaptic fashion with cells of the host brain. And so 
Uh, these are electron micrographs uh, that we obtained after transplantation of cells, again, that express GFP. We can do stains for them um, with antibodies that are gold conjugated here. There's small gold beads on these uh, antibodies here. And so we stain these cells to identify the transplanted cells. And we see here with EM is that this transplanted cell here, you see the membrane of the cell coming around like this, is receiving synapses from cells of the recipient brain. So there are afferent inputs coming in from recipient neurons onto this transplanted cell. Additionally, when we look at this transplanted cell here with its membrane like this, we see synaptic vesicles here presynaptically in the transplanted cell. So additionally, a transplanted cell is making synaptic outputs onto neurons of the recipient brain. We additionally demonstrated this by doing dual patch recordings of cells, both native cells and, and uh, transplanted cells. And so what we found is that when we electrically stimulate a native cell here, we're able with stimulation like this to record in responses, excitatory responses in a transplanted cell. So the cell is receiving synaptic inputs from the one that we stimulated here. Additionally, when we go on to stimulate a transplanted cell, we see with the stimulation here, we see responses in native cells. So, so transplants are both receiving synaptic inputs and forming synaptic outputs uh, with uh, neurons of the recipient brain. So transplantation has pretty profound effects on inhibition onto neurons of the recipient. So we do recordings of excitatory neurons in the neocortex after transplantation of these inhibitory interneurons, we find that the frequency of inhibitory synaptic events onto those excitatory cells is increased by transplantation. So we quantified that, we found there's about, in some repeated number of studies, find there's about a 40% increase in the frequency of inhibitory events onto excitatory cells after transplants are performed. That takes some time to develop, somewhere around 30 days after transplantation, at least with rodent cells. So that brings us to the rationale for using interneuron transplantation as an epilepsy therapy. So epilepsy in crude terms involves pathophysiologic processes that result in the hyperexcitability of cells and network hypersynchrony. It's known that in some cases of epilepsy, interneuron loss or dysfunction contribute to this hyperexcitability of circuits and networks. So as transplantation yields new functional inhibition, that could potentially reduce or compensate for some of the circuit and network abnormalities that lead to seizures. So there've been a number of preclinical studies that have looked at interneuron transplantation as an epilepsy therapy in rodent models of epilepsy. So I was involved in the first study, which was completed in 2009, that looked at the transplantation of mouse MGE cells, the cell type that had been most characterized in wild type models, looked at the transplantation of these cells into neonatal KV1.1 mutant mice. So this is a model of generalized epilepsy where this potassium channel mutation leads to the hyperexcitability of cells in the recipient. So we transplanted these cells to the bilateral neocortex and neonatal mice just as they're starting to develop seizures then did these video EEG recordings around 30 to 40 days after transplantation. And that was a time point at which our previous studies has shown these transplanted cells have integrated and functionally matured in the recipient. What we found here, and this is just uh, representative EEG traces, is that transplantation by around 80 to 90% reduced the frequency of seizure events in this generalized epilepsy model. And also the seizure that still uh, occurred after transplantation, it also reduced the duration of the seizure events as well. So there are a number of other studies that looked at transplantation of mouse MG cells in epilepsy models, but thinking ahead about potential clinical applications, there was an interest that turned to actually making human populations of interneurons and then testing those in preclinical models. And so in 2014, the first paper was published that looked at the transplantation of human stem cell derived interneurons into a more focal model of epilepsy. And so uh, this involved the uh, transplantation of pluripotent stem cell derived human interneurons into adult mice that had undergone systemic pilocarpine treatment. So this induces a period of status epilepticus in these uh, rodents thereafter they develop spontaneous seizures. So transplants in this case were targeted to the bilateral hippocampus. What they found actually by using cells that came from uh, lines that express channel rhodopsins. This allows uh, light stimulation of the transplanted cells. They found that, that stimulation of those cells evoked inhibitory responses in host neurons. And so you activate the transplanted cells, you see inhibitory responses in cells of the recipient, and these cells are integrating into the disease hippocampus in this case. They found that transplantation also reduced uh, spontaneous uh, seizures in the recipients. 
and improve some of the epilepsy associated behavioral deficits that those, those animals had exhibited. <clears throat> there have been additional studies in this case, thinking again about donor cell sources. So instead of using allergenic cells, actually using induced pluripotent stem cells. So this would uh, potentially in, in clinical scenarios allow us to do autologous cell type transplants. So previous study was looking at pluripotent stem cell lines. In this case, uh, these were induced pluripotent stem cells that came from differentiated cell types, taken back to immature states, and then differentiated towards interneuron uh, phenotypes. Those cells were transplanted to adult rats that had undergone uh, in the same way as systemic pilocarpine treatment, cells were again placed in the hippocampus. What was interesting here is that they actually use cell types that can be chemogenetically suppressed uh, using DREDS. So that allows the application of a designer drug that suppresses the activity selectively of the transplant population. What they found is that without the cells being suppressed, the seizures had been reduced. When the transplanted cells were suppressed, the seizure phenotype started to revert and come back in these recipients. So again, suggesting that these cells are actually integrated networks, it's their activity that's important for ongoing seizure suppression. So that leads us to potential clinical applications whereby we may use these cells in uh, different patient settings. And so one example, it would have described that these cells are exerting local effects where they're transplanted and that can suppress seizures in different models, but more focal models, more generalized type models. I should say that in the generalized type models, the transplanted cells were dispersed very, very widely throughout the neocortex. So it's not like we hit one critical node with the transplanted cells that could shut down the whole seizure network. Uh, but first example is actually targeting these cells to eloquent areas where you know that seizures are coming on, more focal type uh, epilepsies. So one example for this could be, see how this works could be in the motor, motor cortex, excuse me. So say the seizures arise um, right here in the motor strip. This is a, a scenario where we could potentially use something like an RNS. We can't resect that area or use a laser treatment in that area because we'd be causing uh, motor findings in the patient. Currently we'd use something like an RNS, which I described earlier, it involves implantation of a foreign device. There's a need for reoperation with that. There's some complexities to programming a device like that. It can potentially have off-target effects um, by stimulating the motor cortex. So potentially transplantation could be used to focally deliver these cells to the area that originates seizures in these patients. I should say that there have been other studies in rodents at least. You may wonder, well, can transplantation of these cells cause off-target effects themselves? Could that uh, alter motor function by putting these cells in the motor strip? At least in rodent models where it's been studied, we haven't seen behavioral effects uh, such as weakness um, or motor disturbances that could come from transplantation of these cells into motor areas. <clears throat> so this could be an alternative to our current surgical treatments for more focal onset uh, epilepsies that arise from eloquent areas. Another potential option may be uh, to target these cells more diffusely. And so we can say identify where seizures are coming from patients, but that could be too broad of an area to target with a resection or to target with an RNS, which again, as I showed, involve either the stripped electrodes or these depth electrodes, two of them that are targeted in more focal manners. So potentially we could use transplantation more widely across a broader seizure onset area. Currently we treat things like that with a VNS or a DBS or potentially with an RNS with or without resection. So RNS can be used uh, in conjunction with the uh, resective approaches. But again, the advantages of transplantation in a scenario like this, it's non-destructive, it's of lower invasiveness, and it doesn't require, again, reoperation and more complex programming afterwards. Potentially, and this would require us to learn more about the more remote effects of interneuron transplantation, but potentially transplantation could also be used in more of a network fashion. So let's say that we have relatively broad uh, onset here, let's say in this case in the frontal lobe or a less, um, less specified seizure onset zone. Currently we're applying things such as VNS or DBS for this. Potentially, if there are critical nodes that we can target transplants to, that might not even include transplanting cells to the areas where seizures arise, we could potentially disrupt more broader seizure networks as well. So to really apply interneuron transplantation effectively, there are a number of knowledge gaps and clinical hurdles that we need to uh, get over here. And so one of them is really understanding better what subtypes of interneurons are required for the therapeutic effects of transplantation. So studies with transplants of MG that involves transplantation of somewhat diverse population of cells, 
It's not completely clear which subsets of those cells are the ones that are actually suppressing seizures or whether we need that full complement of cells uh, to get those therapeutic effects. There are other issues, uh, as I alluded to, around the sourcing of donor cells for transplantation. So there's potential to be using human allografts, although those, those could be limited by immunogenicity in the recipient. Potentially then instead use autologous iPSC-derived cells. However, there's significant cost limitations that come with those technologies. Alternatively, you could potentially use xenotransplants of non-human cell types. So most of our research has been with mouse cells. Uh, potentially, we could use those cell types in humans or other uh, larger species, uh, say pigs, or potentially other non-human primates. As I alluded to earlier, there's also questions about the focality of transplantation. Where should we be targeting these cells? Be putting them in seizure onset areas in case of focal epilepsy, but where might we want to target them um, to have more network type effects? in broader onset epilepsies. So additionally, from a surgical perspective, there are potential challenges to the delivery of these cells into the brain. So again, most of these studies have been done in mice targeting neocortex. That's in rodents, a smooth uh, area that does not have uh, gyral contours and sulci. So there's more complex anatomy to uh, these target structures in the human brain. It's not understood how these cells disperse in human tissues. Uh, it's been studied in, in non-human primates, at least, not understood how they disperse in humans. That could have important implications for how many transplant sites we need to target to effectively seed an area with transplanted cells. Uh, we don't know how long it would take these cells to have an effect in humans. We already know how long that, that effect would last. So there have been more chronic type studies done in rodents, which live around two years. But it's not clear how these transplants would hold up over 10, 20 years in an epileptic patient. Also, there's more to be understood about the off-target effects of transplanted cells, especially if we're going to be uh, placing them in eloquent areas. And then it's poorly understood how the recipient disease state, so fluctuations in seizure frequency, medication dosing, things like that, how that affects the integration and functional impacts of these transplanted cells. Nonetheless, the field has progressed to a first in human clinical trial of interneuron transplantation. That's something that Duke has become involved with. Uh, it involves transplantation of these cells into patients with mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. And so the rationale for starting in this population is this is a, within epilepsy at least, a relatively high, highly prevalent condition. It's a relatively uniform disease entity. And our current surgical treatments are right now at least resection or laser ablation uh, techniques that have destructive uh, effects um, and can impact memory and visual functions So known impacts of these surgeries. The loss of interneurons, the hypofunction of interneurons is known to occur in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. And again, as I mentioned, most of the preclinical models have looked at transplantation in uh, rodents that model this condition. Additionally, I should say that an advantage of looking at transplantation in this population is that our current standard of care surgical treatments, laser ablation, resection, can act as safety backstops should these transplanted cells have unexpected, undesirable effects on patients. So we could go and remove the tissue and effect at the same time removing the transplanted cells. It's not thought the transplanted cells that placed in those areas are going to disperse well outside them. So you can go and take that tissue out, reverse the effects of the cells. And so this study is being sponsored by a company in the Bay Area called Neurona Therapeutics. Their technology centers around the production of MG-like interneurons from human pluripotent stem cells. So I won't get into the technology they use to make these cell types, but they have techniques for generating uh, a highly enriched pure population of interneuron precursors that do not uh, divide and proliferate in the recipient brain. So there aren't really off-target cell types produced through these techniques. They've studied transplantation of these cells in a focal model of epilepsy. It's a little bit different from what I discussed before. In this case, these animals undergo into the hippocampus, the injection of canic acid that elicits uh, seizures that are developed spontaneously. And these recipients, they have around 20 to 30 seizures uh, per hour. After the animals, about a month after the animals have developed uh, clinical seizures and electrographic seizures, the cell transplants are made in the same hippocampus where the canic acid was delivered. You can see here that these transplanted cells here, so they're stained for uh, by a human nuclear marker that allows them to pick up the transplant population again, which is human derived. See these cells in the recipient hippocampus here. So they're targeted towards the dentate gyrus. They looked at the expression of one interneuron marker here, somatostatin, 
found a large fraction of the cells express that marker. They disperse throughout the hippocampus, but remain uh, at highest density down here in the hyalus of the uh, dentate. <clears throat> the cells populate in the hippocampus, persisting there at least nine months. Sorry, after transplantation. Um, so as I mentioned, the cells migrate throughout the hippocampus. What was interesting is that with the canic acid injections, there are structural abnormalities that develop in the hippocampus as the animals become epileptic. So you can see here, this is the epileptic hippocampus here in uh, treated animals. Um, so this is sham treated, this is with the cell transplant. This is what the normal architecture should look like. You see that in these vehicle treated animals, there's a dispersion of the dentate granule cells. So the architecture of the tissue is lost in this form of epilepsy here. And surprisingly, transplantation actually reversed some of those effects, uh, structural effects in the hippocampus. Importantly, uh, it had profound effects on seizures in the recipients as well. So around two thirds of the transplant recipients around six to seven months after transplantation were seizure free, whereas none of the control animals were seizure free after transplantation of the, the sham vehicle. Um, Additionally, recipient survival was improved with transplantation. Uh, they did a number of behavioral studies to look and see if there are off-target effects with transplantation. They didn't note uh, any kind of behavioral impairments, other signs of toxicity in the recipients. And uh, again, the transplant cells didn't divide or form other uh, tissue types. They didn't note any teratoma formation, any of the recipients. And so this leads us to the clinical study, which uh, Duke is participating in. So this involves our adults aged 18 to 65 who have drug-resistant epilepsy that is classified as focal onset arising from this starting stage one, the non-dominant temporal lobe. Uh, patients need to have a seizure frequency of two or more events per month over a six month period, have MTS, mesial temporal sclerosis identified on structural MRI, and need to be considered uh, through the multidisciplinary review to be a candidate for either laser ablation or resection or two current standard of care treatments. It's gonna be a two-stage uh, study, stage one and stage two. The first stage, again, the primary goal here is to assess the safety of transplantation, not the efficacy, but the safety of transplantation. So the first stage is gonna involve 10 patients, be unblinded, unblinded. It's only going to be transplants into the non-dominant temporal lobe. So again, that's a safety backstop against unexpected uh, behavioral effects. So non-dominant temporal lobe, 10 subjects will receive the cell transplants. Stage two, after the safety has been verified in stage one, Look at a larger population of 30 patients. 20 will get the cell transplants in a blinded fashion. 10 are going to receive a sham inject, not even injections, actually going to drill a partial burr hole, not place the catheter, not deliver the cells. The patients won't know whether or not they receive the cells. The observers that characterize seizure responses, behavioral responses, will not know whether they were a sham recipient or a transplant recipient. So as far as delivering the cells, uh, we're going to be... Um, using this type of trajectory here, typical uh, for what's used in laser ablations, an occipital entry point, come down the axis of the hippocampus, uh, use stereotactic techniques with image guidance and MRI to deposit a cell suspension. So the cells are suspended in gadolinium. So using MRI, we can actually watch the cells infuse into the tissue, gonna be delivered uh, in deposits along this axis here, about a two to two and a half centimeter track. Are we running low on time? Okay, um, so uh, we're gonna have to leave the room shortly. I'll just uh, summarize really quickly. So there's gonna be a number of uh, outcome measures looking at uh, the safety of this. And then again, the efficacy of when it comes to seizures. Um, two endpoints, the primary endpoint again is safety. So serious or severe adverse events in the 12 months after transplantation in the stage two study looking at seizure responses. A uh, couple other important things here. So the transplants are allergenic. They come from uh, existing pluripotent stem cell lines. There's potential for immunogenicity of the cells. So it's important to note that the patients will need to be immunosuppressed for at least one year after transplantation. And as a backstop, again, patients can elect at any point, or if it appears to be unsafe, can undergo a laser ablation or resection, which should remove the transplant population from the recipient if necessary. Uh, so to briefly conclude what I've uh, uh, described today is that inter interneuron transplantation is a novel method for adding functional inhibitory elements to recipient neural circuits. These transplanted cells disperse, integrate, affect inhibition in the recipient. Given inhibition is um, an important function in epilepsy, there's been a lot of preclinical interest in, in studying this as a new therapy. 
has been found in rodent models to have profound effects on seizure phenotypes. We're now progressing to a multi-site, a first in human study of interneuron transplantation in mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. That'll conclude. Thank you very much.